probably got spreadsheets, probably got names, and that's different things like that. You really got a mic here? Uh, this is just for the people. People watching this YouTube link? Uh, on YouTube, yeah. All right, excellent, excellent. Now, yeah, you can see that. Live, right, all right, Anakin Cooper, right? There we go. Yeah. All right, very good. Yeah, well, I haven't really started yet. We're kind of running behind a little bit. So, yeah. are you going to do like an official start or something like that? Yeah, if you just want to say who you are, so I'll All right, let's later. let's do a quick start. We'll keep it informal then. All right. So, I'm I'm Ron Gula. I'm the co-founder of uh, Tenable Network Security. I hold the CEO and CTO titles. Uh, you know, we got some folks who want to talk about scanning, log analysis, you know, possible replacements for certain vendors. Uh, basically, I brought uh, 200 slides. I'm more than happy to, to show them. Uh, but uh, I actually brought, you know, live uh, deployments of our product, doing the log analysis, the net flow, the scanning, the passive discovery, uh, the configuration auditing from about four or five different, uh, different networks. So typically, I do a quick introduction. And then if you've got questions, I'll just kind of drive that. Because, you know, chances are if you ask a question, I'm going to have a bunch of uh, bunch of slides to back it up, but I'll, I'll show you that before we go, go forward. So uh, most, of, most of you all out there know us for Nessus, right? We're the folks that make the Nessus vulnerability scanner. Uh, you can download Nessus from Nessus.org. That's our website, tenablesecurity.com, Nessus.org. Uh, but basically, we've got uh, three major products to monitor a network. So Nessus being one, uh, we're going to talk some nuances about Nessus, how you can do patch auditing, uh, configuration auditing, database auditing now, things like that. But we also have a couple other products. One of them is the log correlation engine. The log correlation engine allows you to send NetFlow, syslog, firewall logs, anything like that. And it's kind of like an intrusion detection log for, for that. But rather than just looking for intrusion detection, it looks for change, uh, correlated events, statistical anomalies, things like that. Uh, I can show you a demonstration of how we can like, look at monitor firewall logs and tell you when the first time we've seen a log from an IP address on your network as well as a statistical increase in uh, firewall logs from that IP. And you're very useful kind of stuff. Uh, then we have another product called the Passive Vulnerability Scanner, which is a sniffer. You put this between your collision domains, uh, you know, your network in the internet, your network in the internet, in, in, in the core of your network, and it sniffs all your vulnerabilities. So, uh, you know, Renaud Derrison is uh, one of the co-founders of, of Tenable, and him and I were talking about you know, no matter how fast and, and, and accurate we made Nessus, you know, when you put that packet on the wire, you never know if the next ping pack is going to take down your, your, your switch or your router. And if anything goes wrong during a, a scan, uh, and things that go wrong in IT all the time, you know, you know, the audit guys get blamed. So we wanted to have a product that was 100% uh, sniffing, 100% passive, and, uh, and could do that. So that's a passive vulnerability scan. We can talk about that a bit. We tie this all together with the Security Center. Uh, some people consider the security center like a you know, corporate scanning kind of platform, web-based, we can go out and do stuff. But actually, you can do log analysis with it, uh, asset discovery, reporting, role-based asset control, things like that. So I'm really jumping around a lot. What happens is we live in security center for most of these demos. So you're like, hey, where'd that piece of data come from? You know, I'm looking at the log data, but that was you know, log data from Nessus or log data from the passive scanner. Or I'm looking at vulnerability data. Was it a patch audit? Was it, was it a, a, a passively discovered? Was it a configuration? You know, a lot of times people get, uh, you know, where does this data come from? We try to make that irrelevant so you can do whatever you need to do. And uh, we call all this unified security monitoring. Any questions so far? All right, so just, I'm just going to hit a few, few more points in each of these products, and uh, we'll get, get your questions. So everybody here use Nessus? All right, so a lot of Nessus users. So Nessus, uh, you know, it scans for about uh, you know twenty, thirty thousand different checks. I mean, I, I, we do have an accurate count, but I mean, there's more every day, right? And uh, typically, when you have Nessus and it does a scan, you know, you get results like this. Hey, I found a certain port open, certain web server. Maybe it's identifying some things. Maybe it's not. It's very accurate. It was. Do we, we work very hard at trying to make Nessus as accurate and fast as uh, as, as possible? Um, when I talk to people who use Nessus, though, I always ask them, do you give Nessus credentials to actually log into systems and do a patch audit? And a lot of times that's like a hit or miss. You know, some people, I didn't know I had that feature, right? Nessus has full support for a ton of APIs, SMB, WMI, uh, a, a whole bunch of protocols, uh, Telnet, uh, uh, SSH, we can log in and do that. Uh, we just added support for SQL, where you can actually authenticate to uh, SQL, uh, a bunch of different protocols, and, and, and log in and do that. And the cool thing is, is that when you do these kind of audits, it's 100% accurate. You know, when we do a vulnerability scan and we connect to port 22 or we connect to port 80, as much as we think we know what we're doing, we're still guessing, right? We're going to stimulate, stimulate that service. We're going to get a response, and it's Apache. And even for 100% uh, right, and we know it's Apache, we might not know that the underlying system is Red Hat 
and you need Red Hat patch number 2005 to fix that thing, right? So the patch auditing, you have a certain amount of accuracy and a certain amount of uh, reliability you just don't get with your network scan. The thing is, how long does a scan take? You know, I don't care how fast you can write a packet cannon and put packets on the wire. If you're going to do a 65,000 port scan for UDP and TCP, you've got about 120,000 packets you've got to put on the wire. And wait, that's a, that's a strain to your WAN, it's a strain to your backbone. With, with credentials, you just log on. You can ask uh, how, 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 how many ports are open. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of advantages. So Nessus gives you the option to do both of those things. You know, maybe sometimes you want to take the, the hacker audit view. Maybe sometimes you want to have the credential corporate IT view. And you can unify both of those things together. Does that make sense so far? All right, so since we're on the host, we got into the business of configuration auditing. Nessus can perform audits for a wide variety of settings. If you're in the federal government, we do FDCC desktop, uh, federal desktop core configuration audits. We also do things like Center for Internet Security. If you just want to do things like, you know, see what the password policy is in all your Windows 2003 controllers, we can do that as well. I have a blog entry at blogtenablesecurity.com that talks about how a lot of people had to react to this last MS0868 type of uh, vulnerability. And I said, great, you just scanned, you know, 20,000 corporate, you know, servers and desktops for MS0868. Uh, Did you happen to audit the password? Because what's more easy to exploit, you know, this remote vulnerable? That was a pretty easy one to exploit. Or just, you know, admin, admin. You know, how, how do we know what the password policy is there? And I got a lot of people saying, hey, you know, we didn't even think of that. Well, that's why we really say bring this configuration auditing in, into it. Uh, Nessus also has the ability to look at the contents of the hard drive. Uh, we have a lot of audit policies to look for uh, pornography, credit cards, spreadsheets that have the word finance or salary in them, different things like that. We are not a DLP vendor. This is not a, a, a main thing that we do, but I have a lot of people who use this feature and, and love it. So it's really nice to do it. What I like to also say, if this is of interest to you, Nessus and our other products are much more accurate at saying there's a server, it's sharing PDFs, than actually analyzing all those PDFs. So if you're really into that, you should probably go look at a DLP. But from an asset classification point of view, we can do a lot of stuff that's going to identify what's on your network. Any questions on Nessus so far? Okay. So we have another product called the Passive Vulnerability Scanner. Like I said before, it's a sniffer. The idea is that we're watching uh, computers talk to each other, and based on that conversation, we're in real time learning about those uh, IP addresses and their vulnerabilities. This works with client-side software. This works with server-side software. This works with just OS identification. Uh, it works in a wide variety of, uh, of different types of networks and topologies. Uh, the data that goes into the PBS is the same research team that works on Nessus. So when we do a new Microsoft vulnerability, when we do a app, new Apple vulnerability, we try to say, hey, can we do a network scan for this? Can we do a credentialed audit for this? Can we do a passive audit for this? Ideally, we can do all three. With something like iTunes, where if you have iTunes at the desktop or Skype, where you have a network daemon, you have stuff on the disk and you have stuff on the wire, boy, you can do, you can do a really good audit for stuff like that. For something like Internet Explorer, you can only do that by either sniffing traffic or logging on to the box. There's no way to remotely say, what kind of browser am I having? So does that make sense? Okay, we can get more into PBS if people want to get in to do that. But obviously, real-time change detection, different things like that that PBS, PBS does. And then lastly, the log correlation engine. It uh, takes logs, like as I said before, from servers, firewalls, NetFlow, operating systems. There's a wide variety of correlation. I'm not doing it justice. When we actually get into the demos and I can say, here's all the vulnerabilities for this IP address, and let's go look at the logs associated with that, you know, it'll be pretty good. But the thing we're trying to focus with the LCE is to actually differentiate change and compliance issues with actual compromise detection and insider threat. We can do things like, hey, let's look at all the firewall logs, let's tie them to all the users on your network, and then graph that. Hey, why does user A have five times as many firewall logs as user B? So we can give you those kind of uh, visualizations and that type of analytical stuff. And again, all this is put together with the, uh, with the security center. So questions so far? Um, I, 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 we, we were talking ahead of time. I can go into some, some of the questions we talked about. Any, any questions so far at this point? Absolutely. Absolutely. So about uh, a couple months ago, we announced a partnership with, uh, with Immunity. And if we go to a blog entry on it here, basically uh, Immunity is a, they make a penetration testing tool called, called Canvas. And uh, what, what happens what happened is we just try to make it, e we try to make it easier for the consultant who is working on, uh, they have to carry two toolkits around, right? So if you have the Nessus vulnerability scanner and you purchase the professional feed and perhaps you're buying Canvas, uh, what happens is you can basically leverage these products together. Uh, so, so the partnership we have is one for acquisition, 
But actually, the product's been working together for a while. So if you were doing a penetration test with Immunity and you were able to get uh, credentials to get into like a Windows 2003 server, you could actually take that NTLM hash, drop it into Nessus, do a patch audit, uh, configuration audit, different things like that. And then if you actually had your Nessus vulnerability scan, you can feed that into Immunity and they have a tool to go through each of the checks and, and, and do that kind of stuff. And you know, although we have a partnership with Immunity, I know there's a lot of other vendors and SIMs who you know, import Nessus and do things like that. So, uh, you know, we can definitely talk about those if you want. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay, very good. Um, so, sir, you were talking about enterprise vulnerability scanning before. Do you want to see what that looks like? Do you want to see? All right. So, um, the security center is what I'm logging on to here. Basically, the security center allows you to target a network and then gather logs from it via the log correlation engine passively. Uh, sniff data with PBS, or put one or more Nessus scanners out there and do active vulnerability scans. So this security center that I've logged on to is my demo system. I run this small network, a couple hundred hosts, uh, you know, mostly virtual. Um, and uh, what you can do is you can schedule scans. Now, if you're familiar with Nessus, you're going to recognize a lot of these different types of policies, such as um, you know, a full safe check, uh, Microsoft scans, patch audits, different things like that. But if you're in the enterprise, one of the biggest issues you have with uh, vulnerability scanning, performing configuration audits, is managing credentials, right? The IT people don't want to give the admin password for the domain controller, right? The, the people who run DNS might not want to give out the SSH keys to get on that system. But what you can do is you can actually create policies that combine most of the Nessus features you're uh, used to dealing with, port scans, you know, thorough checks, different things like that. And you can actually specify credentials in the actual policy itself. And when you put these credentials in, whether they're domain, SNMP, or SSH, you can associate them with a policy, or you can actually associate them with an asset. Now, we haven't talked about assets for a second here, but this particular network, uh, I've got a bunch of demo servers on. If I wanted to associate uh, an asset with my Windows 2003 controller, I can just simply come in here. I can type my, uh, my audit account that I'm using and my password. I could save that and do that. Now, if I gave you access to the ability to use that policy, you would have full credentials to audit your system, but you wouldn't know the password. And then every 30 days, when, you have to, when your corporation changes password, hopefully it's 30 days, maybe it's 90, right? It's a different process. Somebody else comes in, they change that password, but you as an auditor don't need to worry about that. And your system is, is, is you know, you can do all your auditing with everything you need to do. Does that make sense so far? It does. Can, can you make this like a one time? Um, you can make it one time. In other words, if I wanted to do, just add a new scan, and I'm going to do my, my, my one time scan, you can actually, as part of your scan scheduling, let's say I want, want to do a, uh, a patch audit and local security checks, you can go down to the options, and then whether it was a Windows or a, uh, a Unix scan, you could drop your credentials in here. So maybe you have administrator, maybe you have your, your password, and you could drop that in there. And so you, you have a lot of ways to leverage credentials, right? You can tie them to an asset, tie them to a policy, tie them to a scan. Uh, and then maybe a certain user might not have it. I can go add a user and say, hey, I just created a corporate scan policy A for the DMZ. Guess what? User A doesn't have access to that. So you can have all these different levels of access of who can do the scans. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So now the scan results is uh, what a lot of people want to want to see. What, is it, what does it look like? Uh, if you're familiar with Nessus, you're going to recognize the, the Nessus IDs in this user interface, but possibly not, not necessarily this output. So this is the security center, uh, small, small demo network, 594 different vulnerabilities. Uh, any query that you're doing here, you can basically export as a PDF, export as CSV. Um, any query you're doing, you can also kind of save as a um, uh, previous queries. I don't have any saved queries on this particular demo site, but you can drill down, uh, you can search. Let's say I, I, we have some PCI auditing here. Maybe we'll just search for any um, thing that has the word PCI uh, in this so we can see what. So I have my PCI DSS type of, uh, type of audits right there. If I wanted to, I could summarize that by, uh, by IP address. If you have the asset system going on, clicking on an IP address will pop up your information on, on who this is. Uh, you know, a lot of my customers have, you know, an IP address can be in multiple assets, right? It's in the New York data center, it's a web server, it's, it's different things like that because you can slice and dice your network however you want. We could jump right into log analysis here if we wanted to. 
Uh, but does that, does that make sense so far? Does that give you a sense of that? Um, now, something that we can't really do from, uh, from a demo is just show how easy it is to add an SS scanner and you know, scan 10,000 hosts, 20,000 hosts. We have a lot of, Tumble has a lot of very large enterprise customers that do full credential patch auditing for you know, very, very large numbers of desktops. And they usually do it with maybe 10 to 15 you know, Nessus scanners. It doesn't take a lot. Uh, a lot of customers we have in the 3,000 IP, 2,000 IP kind of range, maybe they're doing one or two scanners just to uh, maybe, maybe depending on the topology. Uh, maybe they want that scanner on the other side of a WAN connection, different things like that. To give you a sense of what this looks like in a, in a larger environment, though, we're going to log on to one of our, uh, one of our demo sites. Notice the, the, the same kind of speed. This particular uh, security center is actually also running the passive vulnerability scanner. At this location, they're monitoring a full T3. Uh, if we do a, uh, an IP summary on this particular network, uh, we can see that uh, they have a lot of hosts, 65,000 hosts. Actually, they have a little bit of virus activity, malware activity. Anytime one of these things talks to each other or, or spoofs a, a connection, It'll, uh, PBS says, hey, there's a host. I just saw two computers talk to each other, right? So we actually go in and, and, uh, and, and look for those kind of things. But um, you know, if we were going to come in here and just sort uh, maybe by plug-in family the type of vulnerabilities that we're seeing, uh, this particular demo university has a, um, a number of uh, uh, different things. We're doing some active Nessus scanning, and we're also doing profiling with the passive vulnerability scanner. So you can see that we've passively determined where the DNS servers are. Uh, we've had some policy violations. Uh, we've had a bunch of different things like that. Just to give you a sense of what a policy violation is. Let's just drill into uh, into that there. 144 of those. So in this case, uh, we've got an Xbox console, Twitter client. You know, not that Twitter's bad, but maybe from a corporate point of view, you're concerned about identifying which of my hosts actually have are doing Twitter and different things like that. Does that make sense? Does that make sense so far? All right. Sure, and at the risk of uh, being a, a YouTube sensation, let's just click on that and see what we found. So in this case, uh, we've, and basically what we're doing, as I said earlier, we are not a DLP vendor, right? But passively, when we're identifying a web server, we can easily fingerprint, hey, it's hosting PDFs, it's hosting, hosting movies, it's hosting FTP, it's hosting or, uh, 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 AVIs, different things like that. And why not throw a few dirty words in there? So we have a corporate policy uh, thing that has like about maybe 100, 200 dirty words. You throw that in. Uh, clearly this one, maybe, maybe orgasm here, maybe girls, uh, you know, it's that, it's that kind of stuff, right? But the cool thing is this. Look at what port this is on. This is a web server on port 25109. That's not a standard web server. So this is a good segue into the let's look at the log correlation engine and see what we got on this host. So this particular IP address is a member of many, many different asset groups on, on this particular demo network. Uh, let's launch a, uh, we'll do a, a summary here. We're going to open this in a new tab. If we wanted to, we could narrowly focus on that IP address and just say, hey, passively, what do we know about that host? What is, what is on that host? But basically, what we've done here, if we go back perhaps the last 25 days, we can look at all the NetFlow, all the IDS events, all of the correlated events uh, for this particular IP address. We actually wrote a blog entry on this guy, so I'm kind of glad you mentioned something. Um, this is, it basically looks like some sort of uh, botnet command and control that uh, is being used to um, uh, you know, distribute a, uh, some sort of virus or, or malware through you know, pornography, which is probably uh, not the first time that's, that's happened. Um, so basically, you can see over the last uh, 25 days, there's been a number of, of uh, connections. We coupled Snort. Uh, we've been running the Snort with the emerging threat uh, uh, signature set out there. If we wanted to drill into this, we could, we could take a look. But I actually have a whole blog entry where we actually walk through all of these, all of these connections. So basically, exactly what you happened. We saw the this pornography violation. And uh, I said, hey, why is that server you know, serving pornography? And uh, you know, we saw that vulnerability just like we did in, in the blog there. But then we actually said, hey, show us the actual, here's my Firefox winning again. Uh, you know, show us the actual list of all of the uh, correlated events and, and net flows. It was pretty easy to see you know, when, we, when we looked at this, when it was compromised, when the back doors happened, uh, when the traffic started. And this was all on that port 25109. Uh, when we removed that filter and said, hey, show us everything for that host, it was even more obvious that this host, not only had this host, uh, it was never seen before, 
So we had a bunch of events that were, were showing that. And uh, we could even see things like the actual uh, snort events of how this machine got, uh, got compromised. So for example, uh, these snort events right here, you saw a uh, download of VB script. Just a few seconds later than that, you saw a, um, a network trojan. And then finally, uh, this uh, infection checking geo, basically there's a lot of free services where you can check your IP address. A lot of malware, it says, hey, you know, where am I in the world? So you can geo ID where, where you're at. So we were able to correlate all that stuff and we're just kind of pulling out those logs and doing that. Does that make sense so far? Is that pretty good? It's pretty standard stuff for the, for the, for the industry, but what uh, Tenable's you know, unique, you know, uniquely brings to the game is we can do all this from one, from one platform, which is pretty exciting. So uh, if we just hit reset here and say, hey, what's going on in this network today? We can do a couple things that are kind of interesting. One, one of the things that happens is that any log, NetFlow, anything like that that comes into us, we automatically categorize to a high level type. So we have some type events here at backdoor. We have some blacklist connections. Uh, we have correlated events, denial of service events, different things like that. And these are all normalized from, from snort, firewall logs, different things like that. And if we wanted to drill in, we could say, hey, for, for those 28 uh, blacklist events, uh, you know, what, what are they? And basically what you're looking at here is a 24 hour graph. This is from uh, uh, March 10th to March 11th. The, uh, the gray area is 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Gives you a little visual indication of when things uh, are happening. And basically, we have a couple uh, blacklist events. If you're not familiar with blacklists, what we're doing is we're taking IP addresses from places like SANS, from Arbor, from emerging threats. And these are things of people that are known scanner, scanners, no, no spammers, known command and control. And any log that you have that has one of those IP addresses touches it, it's pretty interesting to, to note. Uh, now, of course, if you have a bad guy who's scanned the internet, the fact that you got scanned with that bad guy, that's kind of interesting, but you probably knew that already. What's more interesting is that when you have an outbound blacklist communication, one of your computers has reached out to one of these servers. We always try to highlight that. So in this particular case, we had 12 uh, events in the last 24 hours. We need to go down and look at the raw logs for that. And you can see that these guys are, these are ISC blocklists. This is Internet Storm Center. Uh, so we had a bunch of of, uh, this is logs from, we have an agent that can do sniffing, sort of our own form of, uh, of NetFlow, and can connect out and, and do that kind of stuff. And uh, again, the neat thing here is that you can actually say, well, that's, that's pretty cool, but uh, let's just look at that IP address involved and uh, see if there's anything else that we know about that particular host. We don't have any vulnerabilities on that. Uh, eight other events there. If we wanted to actually say, well, let's, let's focus on that particular IP address and just get a picture of everything that, that host was doing and not filter on just the outbound blacklist events, but to actually come down here and say, tell me everything that that host was doing for the past, uh, for the past 24 hours. Now we're going to pay a picture of all this, this person's or this IP addresses uh, of data, uh, whether it was uh, snort events, uh, whether it was, uh, this is our network activity right here, we have some snort. Uh, there was a never before seen blacklist. So this particular IP address for the entire lifetime we've been monitoring this network never had a correlated blacklist event for that. So we were able to see all that with, with just the click of the button. And if we wanted to, we could say, well, let's just go look at the, uh, from the vulnerabilities of this host and, uh, and, and take a look at what we know about this from a passive uh, vulnerability scanner or perhaps active Nessus scanner point, point of view. So once we pivot on that uh, IP address, we can just say, hey, let's go look at all the vulnerabilities that we know about this particular host. And uh, passively, this guy hasn't been doing a whole lot. A couple open ports, passive OS detection, uh, a host TTL, we know how far away it is, you know, different things like that. Sometimes you get tons of information here, sometimes you just get a little bit. Depends on how active the actual, the actual host is. Does that make sense so far? Does that make sense so far? What kind of questions do you have, sir? What, what did you want to see? So Sure. So um, and we're using Nessus plugins to um, you know, feed that. So I just wanted to come see the differences here and sure. the interface. A couple differences. Um, again, there's a lot of people out there that use the, the Q1 stuff. What we really try to leverage is the ease of integration. And a lot of times people, they think they have correlation, but a lot of times they just don't know what they can get, right, without really working that hard. So a couple things you can get here. Uh, you know, passively with the PVS, we're doing all of our protocol anomaly detection uh, with packets, not with NetFlow. Mm -hmm. Most of the Q1 stuff is typically flow-based, right? If it's an FTP, it's on port 21. We're actually not going to do that. We're going to say we want to see the actual FTP protocol banners, gets, and stuff like that, and, and, and do that kind of stuff. But then when it comes to something like vulnerability IDS correlation, 
we support a lot of different intrusion detection systems. So regardless if you're doing PBS phone detection, active Nessus scans or Nessus credential uh, scans, we will automatically build a correlation rule with all the different IDSs out there. Do you have an IDS, sir, that you're using? Not currently. Okay, so if you're using Snort, Emerging Threat. We're running Snort. Sure. Right, and that's a lot of times I, I hear people say that, that they, they'll set up a SIM and they'll just get one or two log sources, right, and they're, and they're good. We say, look, the really value is when you start smashing firewall logs and NetFlow together, there's a lot of interesting stuff you can see there. We start bringing in system logs, uh, uh, network logs, uh, host logs, scanner logs into one spot, you really can, can gather a lot of stuff. But the, so the first thing we try to do is we do the automatic IDS vulnerability correlation. So in this example, about a year and a half ago, there was a Solaris-F uh, root vulnerability. You hit Telnet, uh, you do the dash F root command, and you're, you get, you get an a admin, you're, you get root. And uh, we didn't have to do anything. Uh, people out there, all the IDS vendors wrote uh, network signatures. Uh, the Tenable Research team you know, wrote a check for that vulnerability. And once that information's in the security center, the correlation automatically happens. So we basically can do alerts like this and do filtering the GUI where basically if you get attacked with something you're vulnerable to, you can uh, get an alert on it. And this, there's a lot of SIMs and, and, and products out there that, that claim to do this, but a lot of times what they're really doing is they're doing things like removing Windows attacks from Solaris systems. What we're doing is removing Solaris attacks to Solaris systems that aren't vulnerable to those attacks. So your level of alert and false positive rate is much, much, much lower with this tech, and it's, and it's, it's automated. Uh, another thing we do is the anomaly detection. Now, a lot of the, I, I said the folks like Q1 who started out as NBAD and got into the SIM base, um, what we've done is applied network anomaly detection to all of our logs. Uh, we said if we can do it with NetFlow and TCP traces and stuff like that, we can do it with, with, with the log analysis. So in this example, uh, we're looking at all the statistical anomalies for everything that's occurred on the network. So we have firewall logs, uh, login attempts, uh, network traffic, and we can do alerts like this where we basically say, hey, here's a TNM for some IP address, which is our tenable network monitor, basically says, hey, I saw a TCP session. And normally this host between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. has 207. Uh, today we saw 45,000. And this is significant significantly because it's 111 units of a standard deviation away. What does this mean? Does this mean the Red Army, uh, you know, China hackers are attacking? Or does this mean that your, your DNS server is just, you know, failed and this is the backup DNS server? All this says is you, you've had change, right? But the thing is, we'll apply this to SSH login failures. So here's a change automatically profiling all your SSH login failures. We'll apply this to firewall logs. We can even apply this to things like process creation and on the, uh, on the Windows uh, side. So we actually do this type of anomaly detection so you can look at your entire enterprise and say, hey, I've had a statistical increase in something, right? It gives you really good situation awareness, whether you're looking for an insider, a remote hacker, compromised system, or some sort of policy violation. Does that make sense? All right. And then lastly, we have a uh, event correlation uh, language called TASL, very similar to the NASL language, where we just look for tons of different things, simple things like logins from external networks. We really alert on never before seen events. We saw in that, that uh, worm example before, hey, this blacklist event has never occurred before. This is automated. You just send the logs over to us, we automatically figure this out on a per host, uh, per host basis. Very, very useful from a uh, detecting change or also just, hey, why is my you know, you shouldn't have change on your perimeter, right? If you, in your DMZ, you shouldn't have a change at three in the morning, right? So I don't care what IDS you have, I don't care what type of scanning you have. If, if there's a new process that's running, it's never been run before, and you can't trace it or explain it why, that's very useful. That's the kind of stuff we, we do. So does that make sense? All right. Um, sir, did you have other questions you wanted to? Uh, Is there um, like a dashboard view that, uh, you know, different people can get? I mean, the, the detail is what some of the engineers are going to need. But sure. Right, right. So basically, what uh, the, the short answer is, you can create users such that they only see the information on certain assets that are, that are out there. So when they log in, that initial screen that we were talking about before, they would only see the trend for, for their network, all right? Now, um, what, that, what that allows them to do is, is create customized you know, views of their, of their network. So if they want to go in and basically see one query all the time or, or keep it in real time mode, they can do it. Now, we don't have the kind of widgets that you drag, drag around that are pretty popular. We are working on that kind of solution. But what we've really tried to focus on is making sure that all that data that's in one spot is accessible. But the second thing that we do is we make all that data available in reporting. So as you have all these different users, uh, you can actually set up a whole bunch of different types of, uh, of reports that can be mailed out on a daily basis, right? So if they want to have a quick you know, situation awareness, who, who are my top 10 login failures, you know, which systems are new, 
uh, you know, which users are doing uh, the, the most bad in my network, you know, so to speak. You can get that kind of, 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 uh, of stuff. So we have a little wizard to, you can generate these reports and, and, and stuff like that. So the short, if you're looking for that, like, hey, I want to drag my flash objects around, you know, we're, we're going to ship something like that shortly. But right now, we just, we just don't have that kind of architecture in the product. So that's the other thing you're going to find out with Tenable is that, um, you know, we've been around for about six years. The folks that run it, along with myself, are fairly straightforward. We're, we're always going to tell you, uh, we don't do that. We do do that. Here's a way to do that. We're not going to do that. So you don't have like, you know, four or five layers of some 800 pound gorilla or like a VC back type of organization that's going to be pulling the strings. You know, maybe we'll get into NAC someday, you know, something like that. We're, we're not going to do that. We give very, very easy answers to, uh, to things like that. Other questions? Other, other comments? Sure. So we'll just go on a small, uh, a small scale here. Uh, this is a small uh, a network, just a, a Comcast cable, you know, internet, uh, internet connection, and uh, it's it's got a target of about uh, I don't know 20 or 30 VMs, and uh, one of the VMs runs our tenable network monitor. So basically, all of the traffic to and from uh, this particular target. We, we log. And, and what we do when we log uh, these sessions is, is we, mo you know, most, the majority of sessions are these TCP sessions short. Any session that's like less than, than five minutes, we're just going to basically come down and say, hey, look, you had a TCP session. So we can go down and look at this by port, by, uh, uh, by IP address. Was it inbound? Was it outbound? You know, so we could, we could drill into that. And there's, there's, a, there's a scan that happens, you know, every night and, and so on. But what's interesting is to actually then say, you know, if I'm at a large university or a government agency, or a, um, uh, I'm looking for a port summary here, uh, you know, and I want to look at what's going on in my network, you know, you're going to be interested in sessions that are very long or that transfer a lot of data, right? So if we come over back to this other, uh, other place here, I can hit uh, reset, just go right into the logs. Uh, we basically will break things out by, you know, amount of uh, data transferred and also length of session. And we actually have some correlation rules where we look for long sessions with a little bit of data or you know, short sessions with tons of data. So you can get a, see, get a sense of what's, of what's going on from a, uh, a file sharing point of view. But if we drill into this, uh, you know, we got a million uh, basically network logs here. Uh, if you look at this, and I need to stretch this out just a little bit because I'm in low resolution mode. Uh, it's not going to let me do that. Um, but basically, if you look at these, uh, here's, uh, here's a session that lasted for uh, many hours. Uh, so we have some high-level buckets. Here's 45-minute sessions and, and show, so on. But, you know, hey, you know what would be really interesting? Let's look at all this traffic and what's a good port that's used by uh, uh, people for exploiting these days. A lot of worms that use port 22 to propagate SSH, right? So we're just going to go and uh, filter all that network traffic by uh, port 22. Hey, look at that. The, we got a couple different hits. And, and not only that, look at that. We got a spike right there of uh, uh, 1,246 uh, sessions. Uh, let's, go, let's go take a look at that so we can drill in there. So the TNM, all it says is I had a session start, I had a session stop. The log correlation engine is taking that data and saying, you know what? Based on the data of what you, of what you logged, you had a 10 gigabytes of transfer. So let me rename that to a, to a different, type of, uh, different type of rule. So I got some IP addresses here. You know, maybe we can come down and say, you know, what's the profile of, uh, of this? So, so something that we, in Tenable, we, we call the good guys the uh, customer ranges. And uh, what we're going to do is say, hey, for all of those events, do a time uh, direction summary. And for that particular filter, port 22 and, and the IP address is involved, or the, for the thing, just do an inbound for an app. And again, that, that wasn't that, that, uh, that interesting. Uh, but, you know, what you should be looking at here and saying, you know, wow, that's, that's, that's pretty fast. Um, that's not something very, uh, you know, very slow. They're, the, typically, what we deploy these on is like a CentOS or Red Hat type of, uh, of system, and there's no SQL backend, there's no nothing. Uh, one of the big things we say when we go in and we talk to customers is, what's the box count you have for your current SIM, right? Okay, now throw in your current configuration auditing tool. Uh, now throw in your current um, vulnerability scanning tool, whether it's a service or, or and then we're just going to try to remove that box count. Uh, you know, we just want to deal against a, a Foundstone and an RSA type of deployment. And, you know, together they had like about eight or nine boxes, and they're replacing that with basically three boxes running a bunch of different tenable products, LCE, you know, PBS, uh, uh, Nessus, different things like that. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's everything is very, very uh, bare metal, 
There, there's not a lot of APIs and databases between you and the application. Uh, now, I'm going out over the internet you know, to a system. This particular system I'm, log I'm logging on to has Snort, the PVS, and the Security Center, and the TNM all running on it. You can see it's pretty zippy. And we're watching a fairly large university. So, um, other questions? Sure, sure. So uh, what we do is we have a, uh, a support portal and an RSS feed where we talk about the various, uh, the various rules that are, that are out there. And I think I lost my... I'll just log on to the support portal. So the, uh, the rules that, uh, that are available is uh, it's really two things. The, the normalization rules we call uh, PRMs. And those are automated. So, so if we find a bug like in a Cisco ASA firewall, uh, we just push out a new rule and the system gets automatically updated. That's for normalization. That's not really for correlation. But that's the thing that says, hey, I found a login failure, right? So what happens is we have, uh, we used to have about 100 uh, tassel scripts that were, did a wide variety of, of, uh, of, of correlation. Uh, but they were very uh, product specific, right? If I see the snort event uh, and this tipping point event, I know these two things together means, means something, right? And what we did is we actually were able to reduce the number of correlation rules by working at a higher level, just generic types. So I'll give you a good example. Uh, let's look for uh, brute force uh, password guessing. Uh, now this is a good example because what happens is, I gotta find it first. Uh, you know, if I, if I took a poll and I said, you know, how many login failures does it take to uh, constitute brute force passing guessing? You know, is it, is it four? Is it 10? You know, at what point is somebody brute forcing your, uh, your, your system? So, so basically, you know, I always answer that, look, you know, from a statistical point of view, we'll tell you when you have a statistical pipe spike in, in login failures. You don't have to worry about that. But if you really want to have some, some alerting, this is a very simple script. Basically, this guy says, go out and subscribe to any login failure event whether it's the administrator logging onto a Cisco uh, ASA firewall, or whether it's Joe in your domain trying to authenticate to your domain server. All those things are normalized as login failure. And then basically we say, hey, look, every time we get one of these events, we're going to count it, right? And we're also going to count it for the last 24 hours. And then we're going to do some interesting things like, hey, let's make sure those login failures are occurring across multiple systems. Like if I have one remote IP address and has 1,000 login failures, but those thousand login failures occurred across thousand different systems. That's a lot different than one remote guy with a thousand login failures on one host. So our correlation rule will would, would, would pull that out. Does that, does that make sense? Now these scripts are, you know, it, it's the kind of thing where if somebody wants to do something, they, if they're familiar with Python, if they're familiar with NASA, if they're familiar with Perl, it's very easy to write these th things. We have hash tables, we have, um, all the kind of things you would like to do. I talk to a lot of customers who are very frustrated with, hey, I want to just you know, correlate. I, I, I want to do something more than correlate if A and B happen within five minutes of each other. And it's very difficult to do that in a lot of these wizards where you generate you know, custom events and, and, and things there. Let's say you wanted to alert anytime there's a new MAC address that's been added to your network, regardless of the source. You know, so we, we have a script for that. Um, but basically what happens is we get a lot of feedback from our customers and whether it's either a feature requests for these kind of scripts or ideas for scripts, or from our research sites, when we see different types of compromises, we'll go and we'll write, we'll write new scripts. So did you want to see a specific uh, type of correlation or? Okay, not, not a problem. Sir, do you have any other questions? Sure. Um, so I'll answer the compression ratios first. Compression ratios vary wildly depending on the size or the, the type of logs you send, right? If you send, um, you know, checkpoint firewall logs, uh, which are a little bit shorter than perhaps a snort log, uh, then, you know, you're not going to have as much compression if you shoot one for the other. But of course, if your checkpoint firewall log is smaller than snort, maybe uh, a compression ratio doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, but there's really two things that kind of go uh, sort of in our favor. 
so the, the first thing is because we've indexed everything, uh, let me just show you a quick, a quick example. Uh, so I got DNS here. Um, I don't think this particular network we're doing DNS queries, but I, there's another network that I, I log on to for, for, for demos. Uh, let me just search this. So I, I got 401 refresh and progress events. I'm not a DNS guy. I don't even know what that, what that, what that means. But if we go down, and if I wanted to, I could click on that, and the product would tell me, hey, this is what that rule, what that rule means. Um, but I'm just trying to show a demonstration of picking an event and searching it. Um, unlike Google, unlike a lot of log aggregation tools where they actually tell you, hey, just search it, right? You can actually come in here and type in your output filter the pattern you're looking for. And just because I don't know a good example, I'll pick a port here. So I'll do 508, 508. Oops, five one three five four, and this could have very well been, um, you know, Argula, a login failure that you want to look for for SSH or, or, or things like that. But because we already index things and compress things way ahead of time, your searches are a lot faster. So see how that came back, and I got everything with with, with five one three four. So that's, that's the first thing. Now the second thing is from an architecture point of view, the way we've 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 set things up. Um, Security Center is the item that does the, does the heavy lifting, so to speak. But from a, a uh, law correlation engine point of view, you can actually point to multiple LCEs and do distributed queries. And the queries happen extremely fast. So in this example, I've got two LCEs, and I've done a query for the network traffic. You can see that this guy here had a small tail of uh, network spikes. This guy here had some continuous activity. But when you, when you query them together, they just get smashed together. So what happens is that, let's say you've got, I don't know, five or six LCEs, and you want to put you know, 20, 30 terabytes of, of, of logs through this thing. You don't have to put it through one server. You can put it through multiple LCEs and, 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 and do that kind of stuff from, from, a, uh, from a centralized point of view. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. As far as searching, so the search that you just did, you know, how far back is that looking? Is that looking historically? It's going gonna, it's gonna to go as far back as you want it to. Now, my default filter there was 24, was 24 hours. Okay. If I said, let's go for 30 days, you know, if I've narrowly done that search on those 401 records, maybe for 30 days, I only have 20,000 records. So I'm only searching the index thing. So a lot of times what happens with these log search tools, you, know, you search the whole thing, and they, have, they, they come up with dynamic pattern matches and different things like that. Those searches take a lot longer. But when you're working with the normalized data like we have, you have two advantages. One. Uh, you know, we're probably not going to keep, from a normalized point of view, things that aren't that interesting, right? So if you, for example, you have MySQL it's generating a bunch of logs, we're going to normalize the stuff that's really interesting. Start, stops, errors, uh, you know, reboots, new installs, upgrades, user logons, things like that. If there is a certain type of status message or something like that that's not really important from a, uh, from a SIM or security or compliance point of view, probably going to ignore that, right? Now, if you want to do full log aggregation, we, we definitely have the ability to feed into something like that. But for the most part, you know, most of what people have a requirement to store and search, the way we do it, people say, hey, we can, I can get to my data a lot quicker uh, when it comes to that. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, there, there's a customer of ours had a, uh, uh, they, they, they distribute a lot of online media. I'll, 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 I'll put, it, put it that way. And one of the things they do is they, they log all their DNS transactions. So a lot of people have a DNS server with, with logging on, but they don't enable actual DNS query logging. Anytime you type google.com, you know, there's a law that says, hey, this IP went to Google, or did a query for, for google.com. And they had a couple virus outbreaks, and these viruses did particular DNS lookups. And what they were able to do is go to the DNS logs, and for the last, probably it was probably the last 30, 35 days or so, type in that pattern and search it, and the query took like, like a minute. And then boom, export as a CSV. I got a list of IPs. I can do some by IP on that. Even go in and do an asset summary. All those kind of things I was showing you in the security center. So it's very, very easy to get that information. And then actually what they did is they took those IPs, they created a list, and they said, well, let me show all the vulnerabilities for, for, for these guys. So it was boom, boom, boom. Probably within a half hour from start to finish, they had a complete audit of, of which machines probably were doing uh, infected with a particular virus. Does that, does that make sense? OK. So any other questions? Well, on the main security centers, sure. there are two options. Yeah. So uh, pretty much what we do here is the idea is that if you're going to go in and mine this data, uh, you can do two things. I'm going to show it at a different site because this, this one has uh, 
some oh, let's go back to this one um, basically the idea is if you want that sort of dashboard um, sort of look and feel you can basically have some queries that are saved maybe you want to look at all the blacklist events for the last 30 days and that's the first screen you want to see when 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 you log on so you can actually go to your queries and say here's here's all my private queries here here's all my shared queries and the only difference between a query and an incident is the time frame if I want to do something for look at all my blacklisted correlated events for example and then see uh, for the last 30 days I don't want to look for a fixed 30 days in, 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 in time, right? I want to do the last 30 days, the last seven days, the last uh, open list of things like that. So that's the difference between a query and an incident. And then you can basically have these things public and private. When you create a query, so if I wanted to actually create a query, uh, may I want to say this is a query, I get, I get the name here, you know, what's the name? I'm gonna, am I going to share this? You know, what's the description? And you know, the difference is if I have an event, I want to have a, a distinct time frame with that so I can go and, and, uh, and leverage that at a later date. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, so a lot of times when, when, uh, when we log on uh, to these sites and you know, maybe we'll have a research customer, a lot of times Tenable gets involved. If there's anybody out there on the internet, you know, if you want to actually work with us, uh, you know, we'll give you a free product as long as you give you fr us free access to the, uh, to, to the data. But a lot of times it's because they don't have either budget or staff to who even understands what is NetFlow or, or what, how to even set up a snort or something like that. But a lot of times what we'll do is we'll go in and say, hey look, IP address, you know, 1.1.1, serving porn, got a virus, scanning you, you really need to shut them down. Uh, we'll just create a ticket, so that look one of these queries, and say, hey, you know, go here, you can see all the logs, all the proof you need, and, and so on. And it's the same kind of system over on the vulnerability side. And uh, vulnerabilities, you get a little bit more uh, workflow-ish, where you can say, hey, all the computers you have this vulnerability, you need to fix it by Friday, or maybe all the, vulner all the computers you have this vulnerability but aren't on this, these certain asset lists. It's a way to do false positive management, you know, suppress results, different things like that. So. Other questions, other comments? Um, as far as instant response and assignments and links into any other ticketing system, sure. how, how do you guys manage that? So the, we don't have a, uh, like a lot of links into ticketing systems and whatnot, but what you can do is you can hard code a, um, a URL based on an IP address. So uh, I don't think I have a specific example of that. Maybe I do. But basically, as an administrator, let's say you had a corporate asset system, a corporate ticketing system. Uh, let's say you had like, like Squeal or, or some sort of web interface to, to, to snort or something like that. Um, if you knew the IP address and there was a, a, a URL to kind of hard code getting into that thing, you can drop that URL into the security center. And then when you click on certain things, you'll get to see that. And there'll be, these links will be right here. Uh, some of the blog entries and video demos I have online at Nessus.org, I actually have like links out to like MaxMind and, and stuff like that. Uh, but I have a couple customers where they have, um, I have this one university down south that has a, they, were, they wrote a, they had a bunch of students, they had a proprietary asset management system, right? But basically the URL to get into this thing, one of the fields was an IP address. It gave you everything that they knew about that IP address. So they were able to not only, you know, pull data out of that to build asset lists in the security center, but they were also able to log in and get the proprietary who owns this, what building is it in, you know, different things, different things like that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any questions? So all of these um, products function standalone, right? The LCE, the PBS, and then um, the security center essentially ties them all together. Right. So, you know, obviously if you're a Nessus user, and you want to run Nessus, we have a client for that, and we, we support there's a lot of active development there. But from an enterprise point of view, you know, most of our customers, you know, buy the security center and Nessus, because that's a lot of times how people come to us, but they'll extend us into the log analysis space or the passive space. And, uh, you know, Tenable's been around uh, about, about six years right now, so we, we actually have a lot of customers coming by in the whole suite right, right from the beginning, just because they're, they're looking at a technology refresh, they're looking at, uh, Something like that. Plus, you know, a lot of the the uh, budget constraints. You know, maybe in the past it was a luxury to buy my favorite SIM, buy my favorite embed, buy my favorite scanner, buy my favorite you know five products. But hey, if we can replace all that with one vendor, there's a lot of uh, value with 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 something like that. So we are seeing a lot of really good you know new customers. Uh, I, I think because of that. But yeah, to get uh, you know if you get the security center in Nessus. You don't have to buy the professional feed. So if you're looking at having maybe eight or nine Nessus scanners on your network and you want to get them managed by the security center, you, know, you don't need to do that. You don't need to buy a separate professional feed. Uh, and um, 
which is which is very useful. You can still do your, your own scans with an SS client, upload the results in a security center, which is which is pretty cool, and uh, and whatnot. But very good, very good. Any questions, sir? Any? I know you came in a bit late, but okay. Actually, for the folks on the internet, uh, you know, there's there's a sea of thousands and thousands of of uh, customers out there just kind of watching, and they're burning the lighters right now and doing things like that. So, uh, very good. If there aren't any other questions, I'll uh, I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you, thank you. Enjoy the rest of, uh, of Source. So. And the tape's still running, so don't say anything about anybody. Political parties, product vendors, speakers. <laughs>